Coming up on Theater Talk. You're on stage with a lot of lines and, and a lot to do. How long did it take you to get yourselves in the place to have all that stamina? I think we're, we're just getting I there think we're now. We're just getting there. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're not kidding. Yeah. Well, actually, we talked with each other the other night. So, isn't it isn't nice it, to kind of I listen thought, to know, the play I, now? <laughs> <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. And then we saw it, two boys facing each other, one in uniform, one in jeans, weapons in hand, hate flowing between them. Their faces are exactly the same, the same fear, the same desperate desire to be anywhere but here, to not be doing this to this other boy. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Michael, one of the highlights of the Broadway season and the theater season is the new play, Oslo, telling a very interesting backstory about the Oslo Accords of the early 90s. It was written by our guest, J.T. Rogers, and it stars two wonderful actors, Jennifer Ely and Jefferson Mays, who <laughs> play... Together for the camera <laughs> shot. Together for the camera <laughs> shot. <laughs> They're actually a twin. They both yeah. yeah. Sideshow. <laughs> we played Kaya Larson and his wife, Mona Yule, who brought the Oslo Accords The two together. Norwegians who came the up with Norwegians. the idea for the Oslo Accords. And we are joined by Bartlett Scher, who is the direct director and leads the team into this marvelous, critically acclaimed production. Thank you all for being here. Bartlett, it seems that anything that happens at Lincoln Center, you direct. Do they allow anyone else to direct at that? <laughs> um, uh, well, yes, of course, many wonderful people. Yeah, I, you know, I, I love directing there, and I love the Beaumont. The Beaumont my uh, J favorite space. So. JT, tell us, uh, where did the idea for this play come from? Well, in a, in a roundabout way, Bart here, um, in the way that only happens in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, Bart, his daughter, was best friends with a girl in school, and that girl's parents turned out to be Mona Yule and Taya Larson. <gasps> yeah. And Bart and I were working, Bart was doing the American premiere of my play, Blood and Gifts, mm -hmm. at uh, Mitzi Newhouse a few years ago. And I brought in spies and diplomats to talk to the actors, and he brought in Larson, who is a high-ranking diplomat w for the UN, a special envoy to the Lebanon. And we we're all captivated by his stories. And he and I went out for a drink, and Bart was clever enough not to tell me, oh, there could be a play here, because then of course... Oh, you were, you were really it. orchestrating this. It might have been a version of... Just a of, touch uh, of diplomacy. Playwrightsmatch.com. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I went out to P.J. Clark's, the beloved yeah, P.J. Clark's, sure. where we go, and uh, we had a number of martinis, and I started to find out that there was a little back channel. And I think of myself as, you know, I, I felt politics like sports. Mm. Yeah. So I thought, how do I not know about this? Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and I just learned the snippets, and he didn't want to you sort of toot his own horn. So immediately then I'm more interested. Why are you being so you right. know, circumspect? And I started to discover that there had been this the PLO and the Israeli government and rental cars and too much whiskey and castles. And I thought, my God, that is my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of went off down a rabbit hole researching and traveling and meeting people. And um, here we are. You think these uh, history play can be a little intimidating, but you seem to have found, Bart, from knowing this, this real man, that there's a human element. Yeah. That oh. that's what we go into. Yeah, we would sit at soccer matches with watching our kids play soccer, and he would tell me the most outrageous stories. Yeah. I couldn't believe how incredible they were, whether it was about the withdrawal of Syria from Lebanon or negotiating this thing or that thing, and they were all incredible. But this was particularly interesting, and he dug out even more stories. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was one of those things where, you know, you start to hear the tip of the iceberg and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I went back to him and I said, oh my God, I've got an idea for a play. And he's like, oh really, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but then well, what you have to do, because it's, is you, you, you meet people, you talk to them, and then you build a proverbial Chinese wall and I'm, you know, they, I can't speak to you, can't know anything. And even Bard, who was as excited as I, said, you know, I'll give you the script in 12 months, don't ask, you know, don't ask till then. Mm -hmm. And then I went off and said, I think not only is this sort of a thrilling, a sort of an intellectual thriller, but it's just amazingly funny, which is what I'm always interested in and with my plays is how do you tell, yes, I want it to be about politics, yes, I want it to be about history, but the point is it has to be entertaining. Yeah. I like to learn things in the theater if I'm having a good time. Right. I don't like to learn things when I'm thinking to myself, wow, they're really trying to teach me a lot. Jefferson, what was the term that, the, that uh, Taya had for how bringing the people together? There, there was a term that they used where you're going to have the people become friends. 
Right. Gradualism, yes. as he calls it, in which, uh, rather than, as opposed to totalism. Yes. Um, and uh, gradualism boils down simply to uh, bringing the, uh, the parties in question together um, as, as human beings. As human beings, yeah. Uh, so they can eat together and drink together and Particularly uh, drink together. together and, yes, there's a lot of a lot, <laughs> scotch flows yes. in this production. Yeah. All the negotiating up to that point <clears throat> had always been huge conferences with long tables and people arguing very intensely, uh, very publicly. Mm -hmm. And for show. So, yeah, for show. And he was a trained, you know, organizational psych psychologist who then thought, well, what if you brought them into private quarters, no one was around, yeah. and then go piece by piece gradually from one event mm -hmm. to the next and have them discuss it, would you come out with different results? Uh, Jennifer, I want to ask you, what do you think motivated this couple to, to do this? They saw an opportunity. Uh, they, Norway was in a, is in a, ve was in a very special um, position because they did have neutrality with both sides, with both sides which was yeah. mm -hmm. unusual. And Mona, her first posting was in Cairo, so they were they were sort of stationed there. Mm -hmm. And Taya took some time off from his um, from Fafo from his uh, his work in in Norway. A think tank that he ran in Norway, and he met uh, and he Yasser met Arafat's, Arafat's brother. brother. Yeah, they had these connections, and it was yeah. And then he went off to do a. Um, a survey, survey of Gaza, survey. yeah, a survey of Gaza, and, and during that survey, met all the Israelis. So he was positioned to know higher ups among the Palestinians and the Israelis. And he had the trust; they had the trust of both sides. They did, and it wasn't ever a because um, it wasn't begun to become the the Oslo Accords, yeah. obviously, or even to become any accords. It was supposed to just be a back channel that would feed the mm -hmm. official public Madrid. negotiation. And Norway is good for theater because it's neutral. So you don't enter it from the point of view of the Americans or from the Palestinians, that you have a neutral proxy for the audience to enter the peace. And Norway had a lot of authority because they had a lot of money and they were giving aid to both sides. Right, the so North they could, Sea oil. Yeah, they, yeah. Could, they could push both sides a little bit more quietly because they had authority in both cases. One of the things I'd always wanted to write a play about is quote unquote Israel-Palestine, but the answer was always, well, you can't, you can't. And so when I heard about this, I thought, ah, as Bart's saying, that you come at it this way, and then the play is not about he said, she said. It's about, isn't it fascinating how everything else off kilter, and now we get to see everybody's point of view. And the thing that was really fascinating to me, which we haven't even talked about, was when I'm meeting with Taya and then knowing, talking to the security guards in Norway, the Secret Service agents, because everyone in the play is based on a real human being, from mm -hmm. the bottle washers to the Prime Minister of Israel. They're all my words, but it's their names and their stories. But I realized that they talked about the rules as Jefferson was saying, well, you have to come, you have to eat together, you have to talk together, we can talk about the past, we have to do this. And I thought, oh, I completely understand this. This is how we rehearse a play. These are rules to create intimate intimacy mm -hmm. very swiftly mm -hmm. because we're going to do difficult things together. Right. And we have to trust each other. And I thought, oh, I can write a play about that because I instinctively exactly know how that happens. Hmm. Have you met them? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Taya has been very much in evidence all through the. Process. Now, are, are there aspects of Taya that Jefferson has that made you choose him for the part, or is it just that he's a wonderful actor? Deep intelligence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, Ty is a very unique character, and in all cases, we didn't try to make the actors mm -hmm. do imitations of the people they were playing. Yeah. We wanted to pick people who were great actors and then build a part with them which was why we had a rule with Taya and Mona that they couldn't see the play or have any read sort it of, or anything. couldn't read it. No, they had no say over the play yeah, as it developed. Yeah. And then they just came and saw it. Mona saw it for the first time at opening last year. Really? Thursday. She must have yeah. been. Oh, so had you, had you met Mona before? I met her for the first time in October really briefly. We did a photograph together, but um, I, during the whole run in the new house, I'd never Any had curiosity, any though, as an actress playing somebody who exists to get to know them at all? So there's something about them that you might draw on, or you're no, not interested in that? No, not really. Yes. Um, I, I watched what I could find of her online, and um, obviously Bart and JT know her. But I was thinking, you know, there are a couple of things that, little mannerisms and stuff that I kind of, I guess, by osmosis took him from watching her online. But I don't think there's anything that I actually um, ever took from anything that JT or Bart said about their personal experience of her, because the things that are in the play are... You know, yeah, it, it's a funny thing because even more than anything I've written, where it's on one hand deeply true, but on mm -hmm. the other hand completely me. So people would say, "So to do that," I'm like, "I don't even really know. That's just that's Mona Yule as filtered through a kid from the Midwest who writes plays." Ah. No, so it becomes a sort of odd alchemy. 
I'm looking forward to a play where everyone is either made up or dead next time. <laughs> <laughs> it is a disconcerting thing as an actor, though, playing someone who's yeah, actually... Yeah, I can only living. imagine. Yeah. You know, I, I play, and I and my own wife, I played Charlotte von Malsdorf, yeah, yeah, who yeah. died yeah. before right. uh, came to Broadway, and I never met her. And I always had uh, mixed feelings about that, thinking how wonderful it would have been to, to meet her. Um, but now I think a certain degree of aesthetic distance. <laughs> I have cured me of this. <laughs> aesthetic distance is necessary and, and desirable, certainly. Um, because as an actor, you want to be like Jane Goodall with a troop yeah. of chimpanzees <laughs> and just sort of sit there in their midst and watch them, you know. It sounds like what a director does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is the Jane Goodall of the American <laughs> <laughs> these, these are very rigorous roles. You're on stage with a lot of lines and, and a lot to do. How long did it take you to get yourselves in the place to have all that stamina? I think we're, we're just getting I there think we're now. we're just getting there. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're not kidding. Yeah. Well, actually, we talked to each other the other night. So, isn't it <laughs> nice to kind of I listen to the play now? What other people are saying. And but and But up until quite recently, too, uh, Jennifer and I had little index sheets. cards in our in pockets, our pockets. Oh. to like what happens yeah. next. What yeah. chair you know, do you I know move I'm supposed when? to be entering with a bottle yeah. of some sort <laughs> and, a, and a couch. But now <laughs> we've, we're letting that go. Yeah. Aren't we? and now did it's you know they had the cheat sheets? Uh, yes, of course. There's 64 <laughs> scenes, oh, my and goodness. it's like constantly in motion, and it was harder to do than any musical I ever did at the Beaumont really? or anywhere. It's enormous. It looks very elegant and simple, but it's incredibly complicated between video and between cues in between switch and switch and switch and, the, and hitting your the, marks and, and, the, the, yeah, yeah, and, the, and the transitions are instant so well, like one scene has bang right there. I mean Bart has a choreographic ability that no one else in the American theater does and, and in devising the play having seen not just as an audience member but now having worked with Bart knowing what he could do then it was this sort of challenge slash liberation to say well I'm going for broke because yeah. I know whatever I do, he can do. He's going to figure so it out. So the first week rehearsal, he was not happy with me. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what he's done, but what he did, he far surpassed even what I could have imagined. Because there's a sweep to it that in a way, you, when you're, you're surprised, it's actually, I think it's even more, because I put some more scenes and more than 64 scenes. Oh, okay. But you have no get idea. Get the index cards out again. Yeah. Yeah. Really, it's so complicated. Yeah. Bart, it's created such a beautiful, constant dance yeah, that the audience seen. just goes, wow. It puts me in mind of uh, one of my favorite writers, David Hare. Yeah. And with Stuff Happens, which I think is a great play. Yes, it where is. Where you take history, but the sweep of history, and you humanize it. Well, he's clearly one of the writers that I've grown up with and studied with a magnifying glass, yeah. That's, so I, I appreciate the, any tangential connection with him. And, of course, the sadness of it all is that there's so much hope, but we know what happens in the end. Yeah. You almost get to the point where it could have worked. It's strange. We did the play in June. And uh, we, we definitely had that reaction from audiences then. There would be like, yes, but it didn't work out. Now that we're where we are politically now, mm. and everyone seemed to have lost all hope, I find the audiences more hopeful now yeah. yes, than they is. were in or June. desperate they're, for they're hope. They're desperate for, yeah. not necessarily that that particular situation worked out, but to see a story in which people of great intelligence and great compassion take risks to solve a problem intelligently. And it's... A, it, I find the eyes much more hopeful or longing for their hope now than they did when we did it six months ago. Yeah, we think yeah. that it can happen again, we right? We hope. As a diplomat said to me about the play, said, you know, of course it seems impossible now, but it seemed impossible then. Yeah, and that's the, true. And it's yeah. always impossible till it's not, and the answer of how that, that change is never evident, and it would never be in any way like what happened with this back channel. It will be something that some visionary... Yeah. We'll think of, the rest of us will go, well, oh, I never saw that. I mean, look, in the 1950s, whoever thought that Israel and Egypt would have a peace treaty. No, absolutely no way, yeah. And people are longing yeah. for stories of watching really br bright, intelligent people competently sew together difficult things and make them work out. Yeah. And drink whiskey and tell good jokes. Yeah. That's it. A lot of drinking. and a lot, It's like an Edward Albee play, Oslo. They're always <laughs> knocking back the fur. But all right. Terrific new play, Oslo, uh, by J.T. Rogers at Lincoln Center Theater, the Vivian Beaumont, directed by Bartlett Sher and starring Jennifer Ely and Jennifer, Jefferson Mays. Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer Mays. May. I knew I was going to do I am honored. <laughs> and a <laughs> Jennifer. wonderful supporting cast. Oh, <laughs> incredible. Yes. Amazing. Incredible. Yes. Yes. Very well done. Thank you for being our guest on the Theater Talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I was nervous as hell to meet those two first members of the PLO I've ever been face to face with. So what do you think of them? Uh, not the demons I was expecting. This Ahmed, what do you call him? Abu Allah. Uh, I can do business with this man. My God, you can't imagine to have someone finally we can deal with. I have thought of this day for years.
last week we were here with the creatives of the wonderful new musical Dear Evan Hansen, Benj Pasek, Justin Paul, who are the composer lyricists, and librettist Stephen Levinson. And we wanted to talk to them a little bit more about what they have done, starting Justin and Benj with one of your past shows, Dogfight. I saw Dogfight at Second Stage, which is where Dear Evan Hansen began as well. It was a kind of a brutal show. Since we don't have the librettist here with us, and the librettist was Peter Duchan, Duchan uh, would one of you just sort of give us the general story? Yeah, um, it's uh, the story of a group of, of Marines in, the, in 1963, and this is based on a true story, uh, that, uh, that come into San Francisco before they're sh about to ship out overseas. Um, this is sort of right before the Vietnam conflict became sort of a, a real conflict. And uh, they took part in a true Marine tradition, which is called a dogfight, which is where um, they would put in a bunch of money uh, to rent a venue and buy food and alcohol and throw a big party. And the rest of the money was prize money. And that prize money went to whichever of the Marines could find the least attractive date to bring to the party. So it was sort of a very horrible, um, uh, you know, misogynistic tradition that was a real one in the... And is, and the, and is that what drew you to it? That's what <laughs> we said. Now, you know what? what's interesting? What drew us to it was a couple of things. It was Lily Taylor's performance in the film. Yeah. River, River Phoenix and Lily Taylor, your heart sort of immediately goes out to the character Rose. She's sort of the main character that Eddie, who's also the other protagonist, uh, asks out on a date. And sort of throughout that night... It's sort of the story of these two unlikely people who change each other's lives and make an impression that's indelible. They end up returning to each other many years later. Um, so it's sort of the story of, of how this sort of young, lost, confused, and therefore conditioned to be like other guys. Uh, Marine has his mind and world opened up a little bit by a, a, a beautiful young woman who's into folk music and the changing times, and, and he also brings her out of her shell. It's all, all inadvertent, but they end up actually truly connecting through that night. So, but she's like a nerd. Yeah, she, yeah. She's, yeah she's, you know, she works at her mother's diner, and she doesn't have a so, much of a social life, has never been on a date before, um, you know, so not traditionally is, yeah. you know, beautiful. Yeah. Begging to be musicalized. <laughs> what song can you do for us from Dog Fight? Yeah, we're going to do, I guess, uh, the opening number some kind of time. Uh, but in, in examining it, I think, similar to Evan Hansen, both of these, the, the two protagonists, the journeys that we follow, they're both very, very flawed men who are lying and, and then things unravel. And uh, what has been wonderful about both of them is, is examining complicated characters and getting to work in that way. So this is the, the where we meet the, the young men initially. They're charging into the city and they're, they're um, you know, they're, to, you know they're filled with testosterone, testosterone hey. and excitement. And they're going you know, to take San Francisco over. You better call the cops and give them warning. Sound a siren. Bang the bell. The memory rolls in this morning. On his way to raise some hell. No sweeping us out. No keeping us quiet. Try it. Golden Gate across the water. See us coming. Hit the dirt. Lock your door and hide your daughter. On her getting hurt. Going all in. Throwing a dog fight. Big night. The party's on. We got till dawn. We'll be having some kind of time. Some kind of time. Living in large. Making noise because the boys are now in charge. Some kind time cut all our strings we'll be kings for an evening gonna be having some kind of time <laughs> So I, I just want to bring you back into this for a minute, Stephen. Oh, please. Because I've always wanted to ask... What did you think of this? <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to ask a little British this. Do you, get, do you ever get envious of the way that m music just does your job Ten times more quickly. In other words, <laughs> yeah. we just heard, you know, a minute of a song. We get what that scene is. We understand who these people are. The, the music does so much work that it's so much harder to do in, in a script. It's funny. I had an experience in D.C. at Arena Stage where we did the first production of Dear Evan Hansen where I was, um, I was, I don't, I, I was standing in the back of the theater, and I think it was during um, Words Fail, which is uh, another 
incredible musical moment in the show and an incredible acting moment for Ben Platt. Uh, and I remember listening to it and feeling a certain joy in how beautiful that song is and in how evocative that performance is of these characters that, that we all created together. And then a certain sadness that I would never really be able to, to do that. Um, it's a little bit like, it's like standing outside of something and, and looking in and, and feeling like that's just something so miraculous, the music. But what you do is miraculous. Oh, miraculous. Well, thank you. As I, as and I, you're a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> We're all a miracle. As I hear this, though, I want to lure you into doing a little bit of a show, which, of a song, which I feel is sort of a parallel in Dear Evan Hansen, uh -huh. and that's Sincerely Me, uh -huh. my favorite song. But I hear the energy of that yeah, yeah, yeah. song. Could you do a little bit? Yeah, sure. That, that sort of boyish, yes, raucous yes, energy yes, of, yes. of, yes. Um, but the situation is Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> yes, well, um, I love, I'm so bad at summing things up. Um, but uh, this. That's why you're only yes, a book exactly. writer. Okay. Exactly. Um, in this number, uh, basically, uh, Evan has told um, this grieving family that he and Connor uh, were close friends and would send emails to one another. And in this scene, um, we see some of those emails, and Connor actually steps forward, and uh, that's who we see when the number begins. Um, completely out of context is Connor, who has passed away. So two uh, live boys and a dead boy are doing this yes, fabulous Yes, he and uh, Evan and his friend Jared are creating these emails together. All right. We'll just sing a chorus. Yes, a chorus. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, they do, uh, uh, turn it around, wait and see. Because all that it takes is a little reinvention. It's easy to change if you give it your attention. Just believe you can be who you want to be. Sincerely, me. My sister's hot. What the hell? Back. What? Are they going to the other yeah. Bravo. Now, one thing I want to mention before you, uh, before you go is the, the, the wonderful contribution of your director, Michael Greif, yeah. because so important to this musical, as we said last week, is so the social media and the influence of social media upon kids. I mean, my assistant said to me, you don't understand what social media is to these high school my kids. My kids say that to me all the time. Oh, <laughs> you don't get, and the way that Michael Reif has integrated, and, and your designers have integrated the social media is a whole other fabulous level. When yeah. the show. It became a ninth character. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. It's so. amazing. But I will say that you two have been nominated for the lyrics for two songs for the Academy Awards this year from the wonderful La La Land. And I wonder if you would play us out <laughs> with one of them, City of Stars. Sure. sure but thing, before you go, I want to thank you, Justin Paul, Benj Pasek, Stephen Levinson, whose play... If I forget. Is it the roundabout? <laughs> 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 Yes, for the joining, reviews write yes, themselves. For, join, for joining, <laughs> joining us on Theater Talk. I'll be Thank the you judge. Yeah, Jesse. <laughs> but we want to say you wrote City of Stars with the musical director of La La Land, Justin Hurwitz. The composer, Justin Hurwitz, yes. yes. And so, we wrote the score for the film. And, which came and, first in City of Stars, the lyrics or the music? The music. So the Oscars will have been over by the time you, we air this, but I sure like this song. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. A city of stars, are you shining just for me? City of stars, there's so much that I can't see. Who knows, is this the start of something wonderful and new? Or one? I cannot make true City of stars Just one thing everybody wants There in the bars And through the smoke screen Of the crowded restaurants It's love Yes, all we're looking for is love from someone else. A rush 
a glance, a touch, <laughs> a dance, a look in somebody's eyes to light up the skies, to open the world and send it really. A voice that says, I'll be here and you'll be all right. I know just where I will go as long as I got the crazy feeling a rat tat tat of my heart I think I want it to stay City of stars are you shining just for me City of stars You've never shined so brightly. <laughs> we messed that up. Or something like that. <laughs> Terrible. Thank We've you. never performed that song. Never. We don't, wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Bowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.